we today are probably at the most unsafe, insecure place intellectually we've ever been as a species right now. Okay, And the Christian faith, which wants to perceive itself as, as grounded in good rational thinking, is also on very, very tenuous ground. And that's partly because it has tended to treat the Bible as a monolithic, one-voiced thing that all we got to do is put all the verses about Satan together or all the verses about salvation together or all the verses about baptism and we come up with our doctrines. That's not how it works. The Satan, today on In the Shadow of the Cross. everybody to yet another edition of in the shadow of the cross i am lauren rosser and i'm here no you're not no you're really not (laughs) i i have both my friends here have fake names today uh Michael has appeared as Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Oh, you said it three times. Now we're screwed. Um, and then uh, and then once again, Jim has returned as God's man of fate and power for this hour. Well, I'm in hell, Thank you. Thank you. And when he first showed up, he went, dang it, I forgot to change my name. <laughs> so <laughs> that was funny. Well, I, w- I was thinking about coming on today as Al Capone. But, uh, <laughs> that would be a... That would be a fun one. Um, okay, so so on that on that note on that note, Al Capone. So one of the first dates that Cheryl took me on here in, in Minneapolis oh was gosh. to a restaurant, and I don't know the name of it. I, I really don't remember it. it. But it, you know, and she's telling me all about it. And blah, blah blah. So we go in there, and then she says, "Do you need to use the bathroom before you leave?" I said, "Sure." So I went in, and I go in and I take a leak. And I mean, these toilets had to go back like to the beginning of the 20th century. Those old ones, you know, like where you come, you're almost mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, and uh, like they're six feet tall. You know, the water comes down like you know <laughs> Yosemite Falls or something. Anyway, I come back out. She says, "You just took a pee where Al Capone peed." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I guess we, we're all going to mark our territory somehow. Yeah, exactly. Well, if 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 you ever if you ever go to Chicago, mm-hmm. I'll send you one of my old um, uh, driver's licenses, one of my expired driver's licenses. Yeah, and then go to uh, Durkin's, a real famous bar there in uh, or pub in Chicago. Show him your license. And they'll give you a free beer all night because you're family. Really? Oh, wow. right. <laughs> Man, I kind of like that one. Yeah, it's only an hour and a half from here. I need your ID, Jim. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, he'll have to send well, two because I'm you, only seven I don't hours. Think you yeah. can pull it off there, uh, young man. <laughs> but Michael, he could. <laughs> exactly. Could, could you imagine the. Uh, I, it's funny. I, I can't imagine the, the Jim I knew pastoring that church back in Old Town Christian Center telling me he could give me his ID to go get drinks. <laughs> We've come a long way, uh, brother. <laughs> well, all things change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to everything, there is a time and a season under the heavens. Yes. Something like and, that. And, and yeah. speaking of Al Capone, who was yes. a bad guy, <laughs> oh, um, okay. we're going to talk about today the development of Satan. We uh, not not Satan. Al Capone, but uh, but as far as the uh, you know where where does this uh, concept or where does the devil come from? Um, from the Bible, the Holy Bible. <laughs> exactly, we're done. <laughs> Satan. Michael's on a roll. <laughs> it's from the Bible. We're done. Roll credits. The Holy Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's it, because we've been talking about where evil began and and uh, where evil comes from and uh, why bad things happen. We we thought this is a a good place to go uh, because it, it raises a lot of questions and also answers a lot of questions. So um, let's th- let me just throw it out there. Where does the devil? Where does Satan come from? Well, pre-show, of course, uh, Jim and I both. We're sharing with you, and and what's r- r- remarkable is we, we both end up on the same page. It's wonderful, and, and for the and for the same reason, so it's pretty cool. Um, Jim, can I just 
quick summarize? Of course. So I thought, I think, I think if I'm correct, uh, when we were together last time, um, we, uh, I, I mentioned that the, the, the Jewish scriptures give us a number of different ways to look at this, this business of where things went wrong. You know, where injustice comes in, blah, blah, blah. You have the Cain and Abel, the Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve narrative. You have the book of Job. You have many of the Psalms that are exploring this as a topic. You have uh, some of the wisdom literature that also explores it as a topic. You have the prophets taking particular positions in relation to, you know, where is evil. You have a, a text out of First Isaiah that says, um, uh, where God says, I make evil and I make good. I mean, you know, it's just like, okay, well, there you go. There you have it, you know. Uh, and and but but the 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 beauty of of Judaism, the, one of the beautiful things about it is that it is it is a constantly questioning um, faith tradition. Just continues to explore and, and reading the rabbis, you can see this beautifully in the Talmud and other places where they in, they're just engaging these texts, mining them, and and, see, and they don't mind the contradictions, you know. And so you know you have you have the view of Satan in the Book of Job, in the Book of Zechariah, you, you know. Um, the the earliest uh, as far as, as as far as in my reading on this, and I've I've done pretty extensive amount of reading on the history of the development of of the category of the concept of evil or the devil. Um, and there's a if you have my book, the Jesus Driven Life, there's one footnote with a a ton of reference works, and I could add another dozen that have been published in the last decade. So um, for some reason, there's a lot being written on the devil at the beginning of the 21st century. A lot, a lot of books, a lot of interesting books. But the concept begins in the ancient Near East, begins in what's now Iran, Iraq. And um, uh, you're, you're, you pretty much have a paganized uh, area uh, with a lot of sacrifice everywhere, uh, hu and human sacrifice as well as animal sacrifice. And uh, there's a fellow that comes along, and his name is Zoroaster. And he is trying to figure out why there's good and evil in the world, how it all balances. And of course he will come up with two gods. One is good. One is evil. Okay. And, um, he gives them each a name. And from that dualism, from that dualism in Babylon, where Babylon is in Iraq, Iran, in Persia, from that dualism, when Judaism goes into exile, it picks it up and it brings it, back with them to Jerusalem. And that's why the literature before Zoroaster doesn't have any mention of Satan or a, 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 even a devil. I mean, you've got a talking snake in Genesis and Torah, but you don't have a devil, right? So it's only after they come back from exile, they, they bring this Zoroastrian dualistic thinking with them. So that's how it's, that's going to get into Judaism. Through Judaism, that gets into Christianity, and through Judaism, it also gets into Islam. So that's why Satan plays such a significant role in all three monotheistic religions. Okay? I mean, this is very important. In all three monotheistic religions, and only in those three religions, does Satan play the role of an almost equal to God? Okay? We can see as we trace what effect this has, uh, particularly after the exile, okay? Um, at that point, uh, the Satan is, is the, or the, the evil is, is only uh, known um, as this talking snake out of Torah, um, but, there, but there's no devil concept. And as, as Judaism comes back after the exile and for the next few hundred years, they're, they're going to begin to develop the origins in, within Judaism of a, 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 an evil God. But, 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 but because you have the Isaiah statements, I create good and I create evil, and because God is overall, God will always be over Satan. So where did Satan come from? Well, sometime about 250, 300 years before Jesus, there was a very creative fellow who um, decided to tell a tale about a battle in heaven between good angels and bad angels. And the good angels were cast out of heaven, and they begged to leave 10% uh, of themselves on earth. And Gabriel took the message to God and God said, that sounds about right. 
with some ninety percent of them to Tartarus and bind them hand and foot forever and ever, and and they'll be the demons. But the ten percent of them get to stay behind. Why not? Let's have some fun here, right? And uh, this is known as the Book of the Watchers uh, in First Enoch. The first thirty six chapters of what's called First Enoch is actually five different books brought together. But that first book, the Book of the Watchers, gives the Satan myth that permeates Second Temple Judaism, the Dead Sea Scrolls, apocalyptic literature, like you mentioned, Jim, like the Book of Revelation, even apocalyptic thinking that even Jesus engages in. Because Jesus also talks about Satan. Okay. Now, the way Jesus talks about Satan is fundamentally different than the way this literature in this worldview is doing it. Jesus does something really powerful with it. Very unique. Uh, and we could talk about that. But there you, there you have this Satan entering into Christianity. Uh, it's part of the Jewish Second Temple worldview. Okay. It will morph uh, into, in the Middle Ages, it'll morph into Lucifer. Uh, the, the kind of the king of hell, you know, all uh, Lucifer is given a big role. You know, he he all of a sudden is is given this major role. He's, you know, the, the god of this age and all of this stuff, you know. And and then we move into the Enlightenment where the devil's basically uh, demythologized as God is too. And um, so the devil becomes Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles is the great questioner the the did god really say kind of figure uh, like you find in goethe's faust so um the devil's gone through a a a, a, a shift these metamorphoses over the past 2500 2800 years um and christianity as we know it is still basically stuck in first enoch Okay, interesting. And uh, I, I want to go to Jim here in a second and, and get some of your things that you brought up before we started rolling, Jim. Um, and, but Michael, to just bring clarification on something, because how you talked about um, uh, the devil, Satan didn't show up until Babylon. Uh, can you clarify the image then that we see in Job? Yeah, so in Job, the book of Job is, is actually um, uh, an edited book. It, it's originally comprised of the 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 uh, lament of chapters three through thirty seven. Okay, it has had a a prologue chapters one and two and an epilogue chapters thirty eight to forty two added on. Scholars look at the Book of Job. They look at the Hebrew style, the syntax, the vocabulary, as well as the theological thinking, and they realize that these chapters are added later. So you take apart off those chapters for now. And the book of Job becomes the story of, of a guy that is not just uh, was a, a, a big guy, but he's been now so humbled, he's the lowest of the low. I mean, you know, the chief of sinners, you know, the scapegoat of the scapegoats, you know, he's in a bad place, right? Um, and the explanation that's later going to be given for what happened, you know, well, how, why, did, why, did, why did Job fall? How did he fall? Why is there everybody against him? Why is God against his friends because they're against Job and this and that and the other, right? So we've got to explain all this. And so they, they're after the after the exile, the prologue and the epilogue get it added, get it added on. As, oh, as a way of saying, so look, hold on. The prologue gets added too. That's yeah, not original. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. And so at that point, after the exile, the Satan is still part of this um, panoply of gods. Because remember, Israel is, is not monotheistic initially. It's henotheistic. Okay, it comes out of polytheism, lots of gods. It becomes henotheistic. Our God is the big God, the best God, the you know the right one to worship. But it's all the other gods, and then it becomes monotheistic. Our God is the only God. There are no other gods, right? Yeah. So here it's there's it's not yet monotheistic. It's still henotheistic in the prologue, and Satan is kind of like God's Rudy Giuliani, the prosecuting attorney, you know, or I'm, I'm you know, I'm. Uh, whatever you want to use as an example of somebody that's always looking for the bad in people so that they can figure it out and make sure that justice is served under the law. Okay. Well, yeah, that kind of mentality. So he's like you know? part of God's court. He's part of God's. Thinking. Yeah. He's, he's in there and he's, he's looking for the wrong so he can rat us out. You know, he's this, he's, he's got stool pitching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you know, and when God's he joke go, ah, look at Job. God can say, Well, you know, it's my servant Job. Yeah, bop, 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 you know. So yeah, that's that's the Satan. He's not this evil, malevolent, 
fanged, horned, uh, three-toed monster beast with wings and shit. You know, sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, try, I try to be careful. But you know what I mean. He's not that. Um, he's still this angel, you know. And, and again, it's that prologue has to precede um, uh, the Book of the Watchers. Because it's a prologue that sets up the Satan as part of this Elohim category. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. Th- thanks for clarifying that. Because I know when when you were talking about when uh, the Satan came in, that people hearing this would go, "Well, Job was written before that," and so that clarifies the, any questions people would have about, "Well, then why is he making an appearance in Job?" And uh, Jim, you shared some good thoughts before we started rolling, and I wanted you to share some of what you were thinking on all this. Well, I uh, I shared them with you guys before we started rolling because uh, I'll lose too many friends if I share it publicly. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, I'm that, sorry. That's our goal here is to reduce your friend group every week, week by week. Just kidding. That's, that's, what, that's what I do on Facebook. I get out there and write these posts to see how many people I can alienate all at once. Yeah, I know, Michael. <laughs> Um, okay, so <laughs> uh, I gotta say no, real quick, Michael's that guy you bring to church and you go, please don't do anything weird this week. <laughs> uh, I, I, no, I was, I was thinking as Michael was talking, um, I think we'll probably stay on this subject for a few weeks. Uh, and, and kind of maybe the first couple of weeks um i i i want to go back uh our friend uh Stephen Crosby did a series um and in, in that series i think he did 5 uh 5 weeks on the um introduction to the series uh, and, and I was like, Stephen, come on, get with the subject. I want to hear about the subject, you know. And 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 as I listened week after week after week, I was like, I see why he has to do this because uh, our thinking in in a lot of things, especially on this subject, um, we're actually kind of uh, kind of addressing the issue of evil. But in order to get there, uh, we have to lay down certain points of uh, kind of foundational. How how did we get to the statements we're going to make? And one of one of the things that I think is important for us to address here is we're not attacking the Bible. We're not saying the Bible is wrong. But it is important, I believe, to understand that um, I'm going to kind of divert a little bit and come right back to it. I've been functioning since, well, I've been functioning most of my life, but since since the early 80s, I think I... um, uh, I was ordained in, if you understand the charismatic world, um, there's a lot of emphasis put on ordination and titles and things like that. And and at the time, I, w- I was into it like everybody else. But I think it was 81 or 82, I was ordained in a, a huge conference um, as as a prophet. And I functioned in the that prophetic realm. Um so what I've come to understand now, 40 years later, is that we prophesy in part. We see in part, you know. Uh, I think I read that somewhere, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and, and we prophesy out of our current understanding. Okay, so if we understand that um, God wants 
the church to be holy. He wants no secret sins. He wants no Achans in the camp, you know. That's how we're going to prophesy. And, and we're going to add, whether we actually use the words or not, we're going to add the authority of thus saith the Lord, you know. And, and, and it's like, oh, my gosh, the prophet has spoken. There's sin in the camp. You know, mm-hmm. Let's root it out. Let's find the man. Yeah. And, and we come along as we mature in this, and we say, you know, that isn't the heart of father. The heart of father is not, and and so a current in uh, uh, among many of the prophetic uh, group, the current uh, statement is anybody can find dirt, but we're called to find the gold, uh, you know. And so, so we don't expose a man's sin. We don't come and say, you know, God shows me that you're an adulterer. Instead, we go to uh, original intent, and you know. God tells me that you're you're a good husband. You're a faithful man, you know, and we're calling gold out of the person. And, you know, and I don't want to get into whether that's right or wrong or that's a world that, I, you know, I'm, I, I still have one foot kind of in it, uh, but I speak against a lot of the stuff that, but my, my point is that we prophesy out of our understanding. Okay. Let's go back to scripture now. Much of what we read, and and yet I would say that the majority of the prophets that I know today, uh, I would say they speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But they still prophesy according to what they know. Okay? Scripture is the same. We read certain things in Scripture, and they wrote, they prophesied under the inspiration of Holy Spirit, filtered through what they knew, what they understand. So if the understanding, as Michael was saying, coming out of Babylon or or, uh, Canaan, uh, when they were, you know, possessing the land... um, the reason why the Lord did not want them intermarrying is because they would end up serving those other gods. They didn't directly serve them, but they certainly took on the information of their captors or the co-inhabitants of the land, and they began to meld that into their understanding. Remember, they came out of Egypt. They had been in slavery to Egypt. So much of what we read in the Old Testament, if we studied and understood the gods of Egypt, we would see that there's a a kind of a dovetailing of that information in trying to explain how God, Yahweh, uh, you know, or even the Satan, how they operate. So there's a, there is this constant mixture, and yet they're still speaking under or writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we're not attacking the Scripture. We're we're actually enlightening or uh, attempting to enlighten uh, what we've come to know. Uh, as really an unveiling of, of, of knowledge that hopefully brings us to a higher learning and, and a higher respect for uh, the Trinity, for the cross, and even for Scripture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I'll put that out there. So, all right, let's go back and, and look at uh, what Michael is saying, the Satan. Jesus said at one point in time, you know, I saw Satan fall from heaven. Okay. Now, what would, what no, would, be, your, what would be your first inclination as to wh- what that might be a reference to? What's your first inclination on that? Is it not the Watcher myth from Enoch? Well, 
It it would be right. therefore right, but what therefore if, he is the God he, of this world. He's he's in control of the world. Okay, but but if Jesus is if Je- if if in Luke it's Luke ten, where where, sure. where Jesus says in the mission the disciples have come back from this mission and they're thrilled to cast out demons and he says, right. I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven." Yeah. Is is our first impulse to go to the Enoch myth and, and therefore validate the Enoch myth as though Jesus believed the Enoch myth. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Uh, what? So we we give we give the Satan uh, a personality. You, we do we all humanize kinds of stuff if, or, we, if we make that yeah. leap. If we make that sure. leap and we sure. say that Jesus is talking about, and you know, and then, then you say, oh, it's Isaiah 14 and this, okay, all that nonsense, okay. But if you make that leap, you've locked yourself now into a dualism that you can't get out of. That's Correct. a very important thing. But if that text is Jesus saying, I saw this c- category of the accuser, the self-righteous, uh, uh, you know, finger-pointing, evil, looking for sin, I saw that fall because it never belonged in theology, it fell right to where it needs to be. You want to put the blame? Put it in anthropology. It belongs in us. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus takes the Satan category out of heaven, out of theology, and it falls to earth where it belongs so that we recognize where the Satan is, it's us. We are the Satan. We created the category. We gave, As you said pre, pre-show, we gave it power. And because it has mm-hmm. power, it is a principality in power that rules us. It structures mm-hmm. our worldviews. It doesn't let us think outside of the box. You know, it tells us we're going to go to hell if we think differently. I mean, it's very powerful, right? And that's mm-hmm. why I think Paul says, you know, when it comes to the methods of the devil, we put on the full armor of God. And the only thing missing in that armor of God that you find in the armor of God from Isaiah and the wisdom of Solomon is the category of zeal. Zeal's okay. part of the armor in that second, the Jewish pr- prophetic tradition, but no. not in Paul. And we, we have a battle. I mean, Paul says we we take thoughts captive, you know, we take people's thoughts captive and that's what the gospel does. And that's where we conquer the devil. And, that that point is is a huge huge point. So what Lauren said, uh, uh, I was sharing uh, before we started um, uh, recording, is that we gave a personality or personage mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to uh, Satan, yeah. and um, we. Uh, gave him a position uh, that was uh, almost equal to God, (laughs) but not quite. So uh, there's even some religions that says that he's uh, the Lord's twin brother. And, uh, you know, they're in this constant eternal struggle and battle. And at the cross or or uh you know in the in the death burial and resurrection uh Jesus finally won the battle and 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 yet there's going to he he won the battle but there's still going to be a last battle yeah it's yeah like, yeah there's there's still, always the last and, battle and and every day we're in a battle and uh Michael just brought out a scripture, and I think it's important that we uh, look at this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Well, if we've given Satan flesh and blood, more or less, if we personage him, um, then we're always in this battle wrestling against him as a person as a being, as an entity. The devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour, you know, and so, uh, you know, and and he is uh, the prince of the air, and he all 
all lie in the lap of the wicked one. And, and we find all these scriptures. And, and, and so we, we continue to make him a deity, even though we see other scriptures that says that he was stripped, he was disarmed, he was he paraded through the street, you know, he defeated, you know, yeah, he's defeated, but... but. And there's the huge butt, you know. I love big butts. You know? <laughs> I cannot lie, <laughs> and I cannot lie. And so, any anyhow, let's, let's see if I can wrap this up real quick. Um, the scripture Michael brought out that the weapons of our warfare, and there is warfare, but are not carnal, but they're powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Mm -hmm casting down listen to this imaginations mm -hmm. that's a huge word we need to think about what that means and every thought that exalts itself against knowledge what kind of knowledge the knowledge of god and when we make satan bigger than the Satan is, when we make Satan equal to, you know, the Godhead, except he's now the embodiment of all evil, but he's still a deity, okay? So we take, uh, where is it, Jude? Dares not bring a railing accusation, but said rather the Lord rebuke you. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> Jude, who quotes First Enoch's holy scripture in verse nine, <laughs> and who quotes the assumption of Moses's holy scripture later in the text. So that's Correct. Jude. You know, Correct. Jesus, Jesus' so, baby brother was all infatuated with apocalyptic. And 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 my point, well taken, uh, that when we do that. We take spiritual warfare away from those are our imaginations. Mm. Those are our thoughts that are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. And we hold on to those things, and then we want to wage warfare by binding the devil, uh, you know, in the four city blocks. Uh, you know, the devil that manifests as this, and in the eight city blocks over here, the devil that manifests as this, and, and we're saying, you know, we're, we're, we're taking hold of strongholds. No, the strongholds are in us <laughs> yeah, yes. because they're our own belief system. That's right. That's exactly that, right. that give power to someone who has no power. Man. So I'll, I'll get off my, uh, Oh, dude, my she, sermonizing! She could, she could and, stay on that sermon all day. Yeah, day, day. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking too. Because man, you you raised a Ooh. lot of really good points, and uh, like one of the things I, I really like how, how you were highlighting that the devil not being a person, but there's still warfare going on. And and what I like is because you shifted it over to this this battle, if you will, uh, against principalities and powers. It's it's our frameworks then. It's our, our reality that governs our, our universe, our culture, our, you know, it, it's, it, it shifts it from, from it being, okay, I'm fighting this horned guy who I dressed up as a, the first Halloween I participated in to, <laughs> and my parents were staunch Baptists. Uh, you opened, you that opened up to something <laughs> work out well for uh, you. No wonder exactly. you're so messed up. <laughs> I probably need to cast that thing out of you. Exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, but but it shifts it over to being aware of how much has a culture and and a framework, if you will, that that is not in line with what Christ taught us, showed us, and lived infiltrated our thinking, our reality, the way we interact with people, the way we approach this whole thing called life. And that just shifts everything then. At some point in time, Michael, I'd like you to address, and and you might need to come back and, and restate it or, or readdress it. I saw Satan fall from heaven. But before that, before that, that was a... a 
that was the Lord responding to the disciples Mm -hmm. who were rejoicing that even the devils were subject to them. So they had seen what we call deliverance. Uh, We have the story of the young boy that often would throw himself in the fire, and they couldn't cast that devil out. And the Lord said, well, these kind come out. That's a very terrible uh, uh, interpretation, but I'm going to say what most people think. These kind come out by fasting and prayer. But before that, he says, oh, you faithless and perverse generation, with reference to his disciples. But the Lord never rebuked his disciples. (laughs) uh, Do not read the Gospel of Mark. Do not read the Gospel of Mark. Do not read the Gospel of Mark. (laughs) Sorry. Um, So address the concept of demonization or or possession, the legion, so on and so forth. Um, Because I think think our listeners at this point would say, well, wait a minute. What about demon possession? It happens. Uh, There's... You know, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. The uh, I- any anybody that has been raised with your um, conservative Christian worldview uh, is going to ask that question. And um, the the best way to, to to deal with this is to recognize number one, the Bible does not give us a view on anything. There's no biblical view of marriage, biblical view of the home, biblical view of the church, biblical view of salvation, biblical view of the end times. There's no biblical view of anything. The Bible is a great big conversation within Judaism. Okay? That's good. And with within Judaism, this conversation, which takes place over a thousand years almost, that we, we, we collect together this literature, Jewish literature and Jewish Christian literature, we bring that together. And we say, okay, th- this these documents are what we're going to work with. The Bible gives us a lot of, of viewpoints about this business of evil. We've already discussed this. It also gives us viewpoints about the character of God. And that's where we have the hardest time because, you know, you know the problem of Marcionism. We've talked about this. And, you know, if the Father is love, how, how can, you know, he slaughter the Egyptians and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So... What the Bible is doing is it's inviting us to enter into this larger conversation. When we do that and we look around us, we have ways of seeing things now they did not have. Okay, that's first. That doesn't mean we're better off. I don't think we are. I really don't. But we are 300 years post-enlightenment, first of all. Uh, We are post the death of God movement in the 60s. And now we're post-truth in postmodernism. We, we we today are probably at the most unsafe, insecure place intellectually we've ever been as a species right now. Okay, and the Christian faith, which wants to perceive itself as as grounded in good rational thinking, is also on very, very tenuous ground. And that's partly because it has tended to treat the Bible as a monolithic, one-voiced thing that all we got to do is put all the verses about Satan together or all the verses about salvation together or all the verses about baptism, and we come up with our doctrines. That's not how it works, okay? Uh, It's meant to be engaging. It's meant to be interlocutory. It's meant to be challenging, and uh, and that's why, you know, I tell people, I cannot go to the Bible at my age, after 50 years now of reading Scripture, I cannot go to Scripture and open it up without immediately being challenged and just my head getting rocked. It's an amazing, amazing book as you enter into that conversation. We have to have that as a foundation for our conversation, okay? Because if we're going to go try and build a doctrine of the devil, we're going to lose. All we're going to end up with is a combination of a first Enoch, um, exorcist uh, type, uh, green pea soup spewing nonsense, you know, and all that. That's what we're going to end up with. And we don't need that. We don't need a medieval Hollywoodized devil because 
that devil doesn't exist and we spend all our time trying to cast it out. What good is it? So what? Where where is the devil to be found? The devil is to be found anywhere there's finger pointing that someone is to blame for our woes. When we point fingers, okay, and we blame people for our woes, when other people imitate that finger pointing, we now have a mob that's ready to yell, crucify him, crucify her, whatever. Okay. That's where the Satan is present. Satan is always present where order is becoming disorder. So you have the Satan is the principle of order. The demonic is the principle of disorder. Or where disorder, the demonic is becoming orderly, the Satan. Wherever you have that, you have this accusatory need for a scapegoat and blood. That, that's where the Satan is. And we see this in our culture. We see this in the churches. And, you know, you've got one group of people wanting to blame one politician or political party. You've got another group of people wanting to blame another politician, another political party. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to fix the blame. And that's a very satanic move. And so what I tell people when they start doing this theologically, I said, you know, the Japanese have this great business saying, just apply it to your theology, use it in your theology. And the saying is like this, fix the problem, not the blame. Mm, that's good. So if we take that approach, you know, when we talk about evil, we, we are talking about a reality. There is no doubt it is a reality. Jim has said this. It's a worldview. And, and Jim's already noted that we give it power. Because we give it power, it has power over us. And it has enough power over us that we believe it. it's true. The Gerasim demoniac in the, in the Gentile graveyards on the other side of Galilee um, was cutting himself. He believed what the community said about him. He was their scapegoat. He's out there living amongst the dead. And he's cutting himself because he believes he's the problem. This is where, again, the phenomenon of cutting, what, what's going on? The teenager in the family system is perceiving themselves as the one to blame, you know? And, and then, of course, you get the amazing, amazing uh, uh, phenomenon out of that where I, 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 I cut myself to bleed to feel alive, you know? And and so you, you've 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 become part of this demonic milieu. You're the you're the and as long as the community can get you to believe that, then they they're they're okay. But someone comes in and says, "Wait a second, all those voices in your head, they're lying to you." So we're going to cast out those lying voices in your head. Now, what do you hear? And the demonic can only say, basically, "I hear your voice, Lord." You know. Oh, I, I'm me. I hear your voice. You validate me. You, you're, you, 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 you tell me I am not to blame for this crisis, and I trust that. You know, I mean, there's salvation there in that sense, and, um, uh, and you know, I, I mean, for me, I, I read that text anthropologically, so you know, in, in a sense, you know, I'm not. I don't see it as a real historical incident, at least the way it's portrayed. With the oh, send them into the pigs, you know, <laughs> and, and Jesus being anti-capitalist decides to destroy destroy somebody's living. I, you know, okay, whatever. You know, I don't. I don't know that. That's you know. I could see somebody, some Jewish guy saying, "Hey, let's have him cast the demons into a bunch of pigs. <laughs> Write that in the Gospels, you know, because <laughs> we're kosher, you know." But uh, yeah. So anyway, it's a good thing it wasn't a bunch of cows. Well, there's there's more than just the the pigs. There's the conversation. Mm -hmm. Have you come to to judge or torment us? Yes. Before our time. Yes. Now that sounds like a conversation. Of being to being, yeah. I'm looking. I'm, I'm looking here. I've got. Uh, I'm looking at the text out of Mark five. It's also in Matthew uh, eight and Luke eight. Um, yeah, you know what's okay. So first of all, Jim, uh, verse seven, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, "Ti emwak kai soy," or however you want to pronounce it in Greek, "Ti emikai si." 
it's the exact those are the that's the exact term that's used in John chapter two, where Jesus and Mary says, "Hey, they 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 need wine," and Jesus says, "What's that? Bet- what's between you and I that you think you have anything to do with me? That that your request has anything to do with my world?" And it, it's it's used in the Septuagint as a way of saying. We don't have anything in common. What are you? What are you doing? You know, your your request it has nothing in common with my mission, so to speak. And here, the demons. What do you and I have in common? Where, 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 where's that common ground, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I mean, so yes, you're right. There is that. There's that. That it's it 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 sounds person to person, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, yeah, it, it don't bother us before our time. That sounds very, very part of a, this apocalyptic view of, of of the day of the coming of the Lord, you know, womp, judgment day. Uh, it, the it, futuristic it, view. It has that futuristic yeah. feel to it, right? And, um, you know, whether that is, quote, true or untrue to me is irrelevant. What's really relevant here is what the demon says. What do you and I have in common? And and, okay. and Jesus basically says, "What's your name?" Guy says, mm-hmm. uh, uh, "Legion." There's lots of us. And uh, Jesus says, "That's all I need. You're gone." Boom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. That's it. Boom. All thousand of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we. Um, I see. I see demonic possession not as uh, free floating spirits entering people, but rather. Uh, we, we, as a human species, um, and it's getting worse, children that are involved in war zones, uh, traumatic, traumatic uh, childhood traumas, uh, the, the more there are, uh, the more we break down the human mind as it's growing. And it's, it's, the human mind is a very fragile thing, you know, and, and we can destroy it in, in the first few years of a, of a child's life. We can, you know, we can quote beat it out of them in a sense. We can make them mm-hmm. live in fear. Mm-hmm. We can create all kinds of disorders and coping mechanisms that aren't healthy, and and then they grow up, and then they they become little holy terrors, and they become you know wh- whatever criminal you want to put out there. They they become quote mm-hmm. criminal, or they become bad. They become a bad apple, a bad egg, whatever. And 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 we think we actually sit here and think that we're not responsible. But as a society, we're responsible f- for the madness that is now infecting people to such a degree, and we're starting to see it in the news more and more and more and more, mass shootings, boom, almost daily somewhere, mm-hmm. mass shootings, mm-hmm. nothing is sacred anymore, boom, boom. We're seeing the literal breakdown. Why? Because we have crushed the spirit in, in 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 children ours was crushed and we've never we've we're broken and we think that that we're not responsible uh for breaking others we we, we just take the blame on ourselves and, and carry on but but we we have to be responsible this is how you overcome evil with good you overcome evil with good by taking responsibility for the brokenness you caused and what does that mean that means you can be sorrowful, you can repent, you can make amends. If you can't make amends because of circumstances and situations, then you can treat people with the greatest amount of love from that point on as a way of giving to these others that you've hurt in your life. You just change your life, change the direction of your life into that of loving and caring for others. And you will conquer more people, you will cast out more demons, so to speak, with love and support and nurture and kindness and gentleness than you will with um, any manner of um, uh, enthusiastic activity, I'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> good, uh, good uh, restraint there. Yeah, <laughs> sir. Like, <laughs> I had a feeling I knew where you were going. Uh, I, so I've told a story uh, several times, repeated a story, uh, a man that... Uh, I know and followed for a, a long time. Uh, helped me with understanding Father's love. Helped me with understanding what grace really is, and and whatever. And I still 
follow him to a certain degree, but not not near as much as I did, you know, 15, 18 years ago. But he told a story, and he travels extensively around the world and teaching on father's love and whatever. And um, he gets to this, uh, I don't remember what country, but he's going to kind of like the bush people or, or whatever, anyhow, a village. And he gets where he's going, and the pastor of the church picks him up and says, we've got to go over to the church. And he's like, no, nah, I'm really tired. Just take me to my room. I, I want to lay down. No, we have to go to the church. And this went back and forth. And finally, he said, why do we have to go to the church? He said, well, you don't understand. He said, there's some very, very, very powerful uh, you know, witches and, and whatever, you know, uh, the dark side here. And every minister that's ever come, they they put a spell on them and two of them have died or one of them died, whatever, right after the meetings and others got violently sick. And, you know, one guy went insane and, you know, they're very powerful witches. And so the whole church is down there fasting and praying for you. And, and you know, they need you to come down there and they need to anoint you with oil and, and pray protection over you. And he said, no, I'm going to my room to sleep. I'm tired. So the pastor kind of, you know, says, well, it's on you, you know. And so he goes to his room and, and he's laying down and he said, the, the Lord started speaking to him and said, I'm going to show you deliverance in in a way you've never seen it before. And he's he's like, oh, God, don't tell me, you know, we're going to have to hand out puke bags and, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know. So he's like, oh, I mean, maybe I should have gone to the church, you know. It's like, and so anyhow, he gets there, and he's preaching. And while he's preaching, every once in a while he saw would see a person and they would just like their head would just like drop. And and the, they'd be there with their head just kind of on their chest and and a minute later he he said or ten minutes later or whatever, he said they'd pick up their their head and their eyes would be just like bright, just like light on them. And he and, and after he saw this for a few a few times, he said, um, "Lord, what's going on?" And he said, he heard the Lord say two two words that are actually scriptures. Number one, I sent my word and I healed them. And number two, when you know truth you'll be made free. He said, I'm delivering them by the power of the word going forth. And I've repeated that story several times, but it isn't until today, right now, you know, every once in a while on Facebook, there'll be something like, how old were you when you discovered <laughs> such and such? And it'll be something like, I never knew that until right now, you know? <laughs> Well, that's kind of like what you're saying right now, Michael. You're helping me to understand even that story. That here's a person sitting in the audience who perhaps they think they have power because they're a witch or they're that, or they think they're possessed or whatever. Uh, and as the word is going out, they're coming to know truth and it's setting them free. Mm -hmm. They're being delivered, yeah. if you will, yeah. by the introduction of truth. And and so as you were talking there, I was like, wow. Now I kind of understand more the point of this man's story. And I think that's really probably what we're talking about right now is that if our theology allows for a personage that is the full embodiment of evil to take me over, 
and possess me and drive me insane and whatever, then any time I do something, I'm going to start looking for that power, that person. It's like, oh, the devil made me do it, you know. And um, you'll, you'll find most often with people. This is what I've noticed. It's when people perceive themselves to be losing control of of a situation in life. Whatever it Mm -hmm. is, they're losing control. And in that loss of control, they allow these other voices to come in and dominate. That is a form of possession. Okay. And it's mimetic. Mm -hmm. It's very important to recognize it's mimetic. Um, I've always found it interesting that as I have talked with modern day exorcists and back in the Jesus Jesus movement day participated in a quote, couple of exorcisms. And I've seen them in my, my, my uh, wilderness survival training courses as well. We, we deal with the dark side. Um, There's no doubt in my mind, evil is a real phenomenon and there's no doubt in my mind that it may, that it it, it 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 is part of that which drives people to do things that are are very antisocial and very very uh, unhealthy for themselves. Um, mm-hmm. There's no doubt about its power, okay. Uh, and there's no doubt that there are those who worship that kind of power. They love to see that kind of chaos. Um, but for you and I, as followers of Jesus, our task is one to not be afraid. There's there's nothing. There's the evil can't somehow come into our lives Um, because we're already in it. It's in us. We're in it. It's our, it's there. You know, hate. Um, I have to recognize and cast out the satanic in my own self, that desire to blame somebody else for my woes. Once I can do that, once I take responsibility and then I can say, you know, uh, I've done the best I can. Okay, all right. I can live with that. Am I perfect? Nope. I can live with that too. Can I do better? Yes, I can. Am I going to do it? You betcha. And to carry on. Mm-hmm. And we, mm-hmm. we we don't need to sit and worry at night when we turn off the lights whether something's going to creep out from under the bed or something. Yeah, man, that, that's good stuff. I, the whole time we're talking, I keep thinking about. Um, now, I, I don't know if either of you guys ever followed the TV series Fargo. There was the movie Fargo, and then they made a TV series. But the last season, and this is just a little plug for our viewers, anybody who's a TV fan. Uh, the last season, the main, the main uh, one, of the main antagonist is a sin eater, and uh, and they do the. Uh, it, you could almost just watch the first episode, and then go to the last episode. Um, the 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 conversation between this one woman and the sin eater is so beautiful and phenomenal that I was going, man, they're, they're like showing the beauty of the Eucharist without like it, because anyway, the bottom line is spoiler alert, but just, uh, um, the bottom line is that this guy, this guy who was a sin eater, that this family's making bread and the sin eater guy's going, going, how, how am I to eat this bread? And she goes, well, you can, she goes because he thinks he needs to get revenge on this woman. Uh, long story, mm-hmm. but but he goes. She goes. You know, you could choose forgiveness, and and he's like, how does one do that? And and, uh, and but then the conversation. She, bottom line, she goes to. She goes. No, we're making this bread as a family. Eat it with joy and with happiness. Oh, wow. And he's never done that before. And so it's like this guy partaking of this home cooked meal in happiness. Just like you were describing, Jim, you see the lights come on in his eyes and he becomes free from the violent person he's been through this whole series. And uh, and it, it was just such a beautiful picture of what we're talking about, of how the, just that that the, the, the world, the, the thinking, the thoughts, the things that the, the reality we're swimming in, the, the world as we perceive it is what is the toxins that pollute us. Um, not not this physical entity that's walking up to my door going, I am here to possess you, you know, <laughs> but but it's that reality we swim in. And I've worked myself, Michael, that frenzy you talked about of, of panic. I've, I've been in moments where I've been in 
Uh, Lily and I have been in a situation where it's like, we don't know how to get out of it. And we've got ourselves into that frenzy of, Oh my gosh, the whole world's collapsing. We're all going to yeah, die, yeah, you know? And, yeah, and, yeah. and then it's, it's, it's interesting how just taking a deep breath, you know, and getting a good night's sleep the next day, we're like, what, what the hell was wrong with us? You know, what were we thinking yesterday? It's not half as bad as we were making it out to be, you know? And uh, so it's just, it's interesting. I'm really tracking with this conversation, enjoying it. And so we're definitely going to have to pick this up next week because we. Yeah, you said next week. Yes, I did. (laughs) And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, because Michael brought up that the viewers probably don't know why why we're saying that. A lot of times we'll air these out of order. So the er rule early on was don't say next week because it might not be next week but this one we have been going chronologically since then so so it's okay i, I lift the band off next week you you are all now right. free you can all say right. next, next week, week. so next so, week well, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like i'm swearing next week next <laughs> yes week. exactly next week <laughs> warren let me pick up on on you said a couple of things there that i think are are, are really profound in in the answer uh, the spoiler alert answer. <laughs> okay, the first one. You can choose to forgive. Yes. That's huge. Yes. Because, you know, sometimes people give unforgiveness a power. Yeah. I can't forgive that person no, uh, no matter what. I mean, just... You know, it's it's. I just can't do it. Right. It's like, well, no, you can. You just choose not, not to. to. That's right. That's the first thing. And 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 I think maybe sometime in the future, not next week. Some <laughs> sometime. <laughs> I'm washing uh, your mouth out with soap. <laughs> maybe we should pick up on that. You know, the choices we make, because again, remember, they're imaginations. Their thoughts that exalt themselves against the true knowledge of God. Yeah. And that's not, the true knowledge of God is not who is God. The true knowledge of God is who, who do I perceive God to be? And, and, you know, it's in my thought process. The second thing that you said is, correct me if I, I didn't hear it exactly right, but I think I did. We're making this bread in communion. In in communion, exactly. It was a family that was making it all together. Yeah, that is huge, because in Western Christianity, we have this thing individualized. I am, uh, you know, Christ in me is the hope of glory. You know. It's like Jesus lives in my heart. He is my personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's all, but the reality is this thing only works in community. Yeah. And, and if we don't understand that, um, then I'm out there all by myself fighting satan you know and and wondering why there's so much evil in my world and why satan has so much power over me and punctures my tires on my car when you know when you know i can't afford a new set and and you know the uh, all hell breaks loose on me, and I've isolated myself from community. I'm not. I'm not eating. Uh, I, I'm getting in way too much here. But in in First Corinthians ten, we who are many are one loaf because we partake of one bread, one loaf. And I, I'm I'm not integrating myself into the community of Christ. And I open myself up to all kinds of weird doctrines and thoughts and imaginations and wonder why I keep living a defeated life. And part of it is because I scapegoat myself. 
So those are uh, two two points that really jumped out in what you were saying there. Uh, I was about ready to take my headset off, though, when you said spoiler alert, because I may want to watch it someday. <laughs> and I, I'd recommend it. I, I love the whole Fargo series. Uh, I'm a huge Coen Brothers fan, and it's fantastic. Is that Fargo, North Dakota? Yeah, they, they have the Fargo movie, which is worth watching first, and then they do a, a series. Mm-hmm. I think it's season five now, and each season's individual. When I lived in New York in the 80s, uh, I don't know why it was, but there's a whole series of advertisements on radio and whatever. And the put down uh, was Fargo, North Dakota. You know, <laughs> it's like, you're going to live in Fargo. <laughs> you know? so, anyhow, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I know. I, I just simply wanted to, um, you, you talked about individualism in the Eucharist. And I just simply want to point out that, Again, then you talked about we're one loaf, this and that, and the other. Our liturgical practice, our actual practice, cements that individualism. You go forward, and you, you, you or, 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 and you get a, a little package, and in that plastic package, mm-hmm. you pull it off, and there's a little t- teeny piece of cracker, and there's a little thing of, of juice. They never use wine in those. Thank, juice. thank you, COVID. Yep, yeah, you're right, <laughs> and 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 yeah, yeah, right, and keep it all sanitary and everything. Um, I literally won't t- take communion in a church that does that. That t- that is a bastardization uh, uh, of the Eucharist. You know, um, it's horrible. And 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 then you get you get celebrity types that go, yeah, I go to church, I eat a little bread, I drink a little juice. You know, <laughs> okay, 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 like okay, you know, <laughs> please, you know. We, if we're if we're gonna follow Jesus, let's 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 take our minds back. Right. Yeah. Good. Good. Man, this has been a good conversation, and we will definitely pick it up when <laughs> next, next week. week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Is it next week yet? <laughs>